Thank you very much for all coming here and waiting patiently. I think um, we've just got a few people who've been trying to park and uh, are coming in. But I'll start with the announcements um, before I formally introduce our speaker. Uh, those of you who haven't been here before, um, the toilets are back to the foyer and turn left and then round a bit. Uh, there'll be people at the back that can show you there. Uh, I don't know whether Tim wants to talk about fire regulations. Tim is our host tonight, Tim Nichols, the minister of this church. Um, what else have I got to tell you which is boring and dull? Um, thank you very much for wearing your masks, most of you. And, you know, now we're seated. Now we're seated. I'm sure you might want to, um, some of you, remove them. But it is very, we're very grateful for you to do that so that we feel more confident at having uh, a public meeting at this time. Uh, but having said that, we're very, very pleased to welcome the people who are joining us online. Um, I know there have been quite a lot of interest in that, and we, we um, will carry on doing this in future, but we do benefit and really um, relish the public meeting together and the questions afterwards. Whoops, look at me, falling over. Anyway, so is, Tim, did you want to just say anything about fire regs? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, well, it's my great pleasure to welcome Rowan Williams back again um, to our meeting. I think it was four or five years ago um, that he came before, so we're really very honoured that he's come again. Um, when he came before, he spoke to us about Bonhoeffer, and tonight it's quite a different subject. An example, if we needed one, of the, um, the great breadth and depth of um, our guest's intellect and his interests. Um, I was looking up what he's published recently. Last year he published a book about the Eastern Orthodox Church, a volume of your collected poetry, um, and of course the year before that he published this small book, which I think a lot of you have probably got, um, Candles in the Dark, which was um, a contemporaneous response to the COVID pandemic and brought a lot of comfort and um, balance into people's lives. I did think I ought to check how I could introduce um, Rowan properly. And a Google search tells me that your titles are the Right Reverend and Right Honourable, the Lord Williams of Oystermouth, PC, FBA, FRSL, and FLSW. <laughs> but we in Canterbury have the privilege of addressing you fondly as Rowan, and you're here tonight to lead us through the challenges and changes that COVID has brought to our society and our church. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for that introduction. And of course, thank you for the invitation to be back here again in this wonderful place. The cathedral's not bad either. <laughs> Now, I've been asked to share a few reflections about the pandemic from a Christian point of view and a theological point of view. And I'm going to stick quite closely for once to my title, which is about lessons we've learned about our society as a whole and about ourselves as a church, yes, but I hope also ourselves as human beings. And I hope as we think about those lessons, we might somehow be able to distill them 
into thinking about some of the virtues and the visions that, God willing, we might be able to grow into as the pandemic gradually, well, what, ends, changes, moves on, who knows. But it's always a good time to stop and take stock. And I'm afraid I'm going to depart from traditional pulpit usage and have not three, but about 16 points. <laughs> Don't panic. I will try to take you through them as gently as I can. So let's start by thinking about what we've learned about our world in this last couple of years. I want to begin with one or two very obvious observations. One thing that has been brought home to us very forcibly, both by the pandemic and by the intensified focus in the last few years on our climate crisis, one thing is a recognition that we as human beings are actually fully part of a physical world. Our humanity is not something that gives us a free pass and allows us to ignore the materiality of the world we're in. The world around us is made of stuff, and so are we. We may be such stuff as dreams are made on, as Shakespeare says, but we're still stuff. And to remember that we are physically connected with our world and with one another, often in ways we'd rather we weren't, is perhaps one of the beginnings of wisdom one of the learnings of this difficult time. And to say that we've recovered a sense of the physicality of the way we're connected with the world and with one another is also to be reminded of the fact of our interdependence. Not only as human beings upon one another, but as human beings in a world of non-human factors and energies and agents. To be physical, to be a body, is to be involved in getting fed, getting nurtured, getting protected, for that matter, getting born and dying. We are bound up, woven in to a world, not exempt from all these things, not six feet above all these things. So there are two places we might start in the most general way possible. Every experience that brings us face to face with our own fragility and our own mortality reminds us of these things. But it's only very rarely that almost the entire global community has had to wake up to a renewed sense of how it is part of a whole system of causes and agencies and a whole set of interactions between people that we're not fully in charge of. Third thing we might have learned about our world. We move faster than we ever did. And that means that other things and other presences move faster than they ever did. We move fast. We move between continents, between environments. And with us, move all the things we carry, viruses included. It may have taken six months for the Black Death to get to Europe in the 14th century. It took rather less than six weeks for things to spread from Wuhan to the rest of the world. And that rapidity of movement in our current world is therefore a sobering, possibly an alarming, anxiety-producing thing, but it is also something with positive potential. If you can carry viruses around at a rate of knots, you can also get vaccines around very rapidly. And although we have signally failed to get vaccines around as rapidly as we easily could have done, and let nobody imagine that our vaccine success in this country 
is the story that prevails across the world. Nonetheless, in principle, it is possible for good things to move fast as well as bad things. And that's a reminder of the double-sided nature of our technological advance. We are in one way more in touch with the rest of the human race than we ever have been, at the flick of a thumb on a screen. On the other hand, we can know instantly what a lot of disagreeable other people think about us. We can find out the very worst possible news immediately. And we can share the very best possible news immediately. It's not much use pontificating, however much people in my sort of position tend to, not much use pontificating about the evils of technology. We have to think this is another of those things which, because human beings use it, can be used for life or for death. And the technology that has enabled rapid movement across the world, movement of persons, movement of infections, movement of information, all of that has a positive dimension as well. And to move on to my fourth bit of learning, of course, that has also reminded us that it's possible to have coordinated international responses to crisis. And in some respects, we've not done too badly in the pandemic period, not nearly as well as we could have done. And as I said a few moments ago, the fact that Africa and large parts of Latin America have for the most part been left out of our calculations is an abiding scandal and shame. Nonetheless, we did discover that it was possible to work together facing a crisis which did not recognize borders. I've sometimes said about the climate crisis that the thing about global crises these days is that unfortunately they don't carry maps. They don't know where the boundaries are. They leap over national, cultural, class, etc. boundaries with cheerful abandon. And so if the problems we face as a human race are like that, we need what I'll call a collaborative intelligence in response to that. Global challenges need global collaborative intelligence. And we have seen some examples of that, and we have some good stories to tell, and we might perhaps think of how we tell them better and more challengingly and even more convertingly. And along with that, as a kind of subsidiary, goes the rather strange fact that we have discovered, probably much against our will, that coordinated governmental initiative and response is possible. The much praised vaccine rollout in this country is not nothing. And we have at least granted the point, as you might say, that there are some kinds of crisis which can't just be left to the goodwill of private agents. It's possible and it's necessary at certain points for government to take responsibility and itself exercise a kind of collaborative intelligence in response to crises like this. So that possibility of coordination, both in research and in governmental action, that's a positive. But the next thing we've learned <clears throat> is not quite so positive. We're following the science is a phrase which unfortunately over the last couple of years has more and more provoked mirthless laughter in response. Because, of course, one thing we have discovered, which we really ought to have known before, is that science is a way of getting to know things. And like every other way of getting to know things, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Because actually, see previous remarks about technology, science is one of the things that human beings do. And sometimes human beings do it well, and sometimes they do it not so well. 
I sometimes think that the skepticism that a minority of people still express very vocally about scientific advice is something to do with a sense of deep disillusionment, as if people in this country and elsewhere too were saying, you told us science had all the answers, and now you're telling us that it doesn't? Well, science is worthless in that case. Instead of regarding science as a skill we learn, as a gift we can make the most of, but which is not infallible, which is always exploratory, revising itself, adjusting itself to reality, instead of that, we've had this fiction that there is something called science with a very capital letter, which if you press the right buttons, gives you the right answers. I'm a deep believer in the scientific worldview but only as part of a human worldview. And some of our problems, culturally in many other areas, arise from the fact that we can't see our scientific activity clearly enough in the context of our human activity. Medical knowledge does the best it can. Faced with a rapidly mutating virus, medical knowledge learns, it changes. And when the facts change, opinions should change. Very revolutionary point of view, I realize, but that is what science is actually about. So, what have we got so far? Learning a bit about our involvement in the world, whether we like it or not, our bodiliness, our interconnectedness. Learning a bit about the double-sidedness of technology, the rate of movement and the rate of change, learning positively that it's possible to put our intelligence together and work in the face of a challenge we all must face together, recognizing that scientific knowledge is both utterly crucial and essential and also human and revisable. But have we learned anything beyond that, not just about humanity in general, but about some aspects of society in particular. We've learned quite a bit about inequality in the last couple of years. And I would focus here on two kinds of inequality. The pandemic exposed both within our society and globally, what I'll call a whole range of inequalities of security. Some people are just safer than others in this world. Some people are safer than others. We are, by almost incalculable measure, safer than our fellow human beings in the developing world. We're a lot safer than people living on Pacific islands with rising water levels. We're a lot safer than people in Afghanistan at the moment. It's always been a world in which inequality of security has been a fact. But suddenly, in the face of a virus, which you might say affects the human body, whatever its color or location, we realize that the levels of protection, the levels of support available to human bodies across the world vary wildly. I've already mentioned the way in which vaccination rates in Africa remain disturbingly low. In many African countries, well below 10% of the population. In some countries, barely 1% of the population. Rates of vaccination in Afghanistan, I think, are somewhere around 1.9% of the population. Some people are less safe than others. But we have also seen in our own society the inequalities of security that have meant that certain communities have seemed to be so much more vulnerable to the pandemic than others. Certain minority ethnic communities certain other groups, low-income groups, marginal groups. And we shouldn't really be surprised about that because we live in such a 
stratified and divided society. But if we've learned nothing else from the pandemic, we cannot have helped notice that kind of inequality. But that is, of course, filled out further by another kind of inequality, which I'll call inequality of reward. We live with inequalities of, of safety. We also live with inequalities of reward and recognition. How many times did you hear in the first six months or so of the pandemic, people expressing their deep unease at the levels of financial recompense for people on the front line of care? In the National Health Service, yes, but also among personal carers. How do we reward people on the front line of risk? Ludicrously badly, on the whole. How do we reward people we regard as wealth creators, mysteriously, by creating more wealth for them? So what we reward, what we recognize, what we acknowledge to be of real value in our society is unfortunately expressed in that particular kind of unevenness in our world. So those two sorts of inequality are part of our learning as well. The eighth of my bits of learning about society in general I'm afraid it has to do with the nature of the challenges of political leadership. A subject on which I guess most of us would like to spread ourselves at some length just at the moment. But let me try and keep this moderate and printable and non-partisan. Political leadership is not entertainment. It's not short-term crowd-pleasing. It is strategic, patient, looking to the long view. It seeks, quite simply, to put in place sustainable patterns of response to need and crisis. A good, a stable government, a good and stable political leadership will want to be working for a stable political environment and therefore for a stable social environment. It will be keeping a sharp eye on some of the issues I've already mentioned. Are we noticing what's happening on the other side of the world? Because the ripples from there will get to us faster than we think. Are we looking at the inequalities we've been taking for granted? And are we sure we can tolerate that any longer? Are we looking at how we get ready for the next challenge and how we build long-term coalitions, alliances, cooperative intelligence, as I said earlier, to meet whatever faces us? Because whatever faces us is not just a problem for this country, this party, this particular cabinet or prime minister. This is an issue which the human community itself has to face. And one of the tragedies of the last couple of years has been that worldwide we've seen all too few examples of political leadership molded by those priorities. We've seen various kinds of populism, we've seen the unpleasant spectacle of vaccine nationalism. We made it, we've got it, you're not having any. We've seen often a desperate wish to be popular in the short term without thinking about that long-term sustainable strategic vision. Not, I hope, simply a party political point, but a point about the very nature of a political leadership that would be adequate to the kinds of problem that we face today as a society and as a world. Those are some of the learnings about the world we're in 
that I think we just might have picked up in the last couple of years. And even before we get on to thinking about our human nature as it's expressed in the church, we can already, I think, see some of the values and the virtues that are coming through. I've talked about cooperation. I could equally have talked about generosity or humility. Humility meaning knowing when to ask for help and knowing where you fit in and not trying to impose your agenda on everything and everyone. I could talk about the old virtue of prudence, that is, fitting your actions to your purposes in a realistic way. And let's be clear, as Christians, I speak as a Christian and a theologian here, as Christians we can't afford to flick past the pages on the basic prosaic virtues like prudence and humility and generosity. The New Testament may talk about faith, hope, and charity, but also if you read it carefully, it has quite a lot to say about fundamental honesty, fundamental patience, and the capacity to listen. Well then, moving on, what have we learned about ourselves and our church and our faith? Speaking as I do just a few hundred yards away from the site of one of the most popular um, YouTube religious experiences of the last couple of years, that is Dean Roberts' wonderful morning prayer from the Garden of the Deanery, I'm very conscious of the fact that in the last couple of years we've learned some rather fruitful lessons about different kinds of community that can be created online. Not at all what we've been used to, perhaps not quite what we would prioritize. And yet the fact is, what has happened in terms of online worship has opened doors, quite simply. Doors which people would never quite have the courage to push if they had to do it physically. And that new kind of connectedness is, I think, not to be minimized. In my last few months at Cambridge before retirement, I regularly on Sundays joined one of the local parishes for their worship, which drew in people from, at various points, Brazil, Japan, and Canada. A very ordinary parish church in Cambridge, not one of the big student congregations, but a very ordinary parish church. But people wanted to be part of it and by various kinds of accident stumbled across this online togetherness. Because we not only had a uh, celebration of the Eucharist broadcast online, we would also hang around afterwards for some conversation and discussion online. So new kinds of community, yes. And I hope we can have at least a little bit of the grace to recognize that for all that's been lost and diminished and threatened in the past couple of years in terms of our worship as a church, something has opened up for some people. I'll come back to that a little later. We've learned that community is not just physical proximity. We've learned sometimes that what we can encounter and experience online can be surprisingly what should I say, more engaging, more searching than some of what we experience face to face. So we might perhaps want to give thanks for that now and then. And yet, of course, second point, we can't not lament the physical connections that we've lost. Back to what I said right at the beginning, if we really are bodily beings as human, involved with one another as bodies, there is bound to be a kind of ache, a kind of homesickness 
for physical contact. I would venture the guess that everybody in this church felt it when they were first allowed to hug somebody they really loved for the first time after a long period. I can certainly remember the first time I saw my, my children after several months of non-physical contact and the immense transforming beauty of that sheer physical touch. And to know what we've lost, to feel what we've lost, is of course a way of recognizing what matters to us. It's often said, isn't it, in half jest, you don't know what you value until you start missing it. And some of that proximity, that neighborliness, that unthought, regular being in touch, literally in touch, to notice that we're missing it tells us how and why it matters. And I think there's been enough of that around to counter the unhappy suspicion that you sometimes see expressed that people will never want to be together in a building again. Those of us who are clergy all know the extreme difficulty of getting people back into church post-COVID. That's another conversation. And yet what is remarkable is that people, while they may be grateful for online connectedness, don't therefore give up on the other kind. They still wish to be shoulder to shoulder and sometimes even cheek to cheek. And while we, certainly in our parish church, we continue to wave at one another during the peace on Sunday mornings, I suspect that about 95% of us are just itching, as you might say, to get our hands on one another again. <laughs> so, new kinds of community, a sense of what we've lost, pluses and minuses. And just thirdly, to elaborate for a moment on new kinds of community, what I'm talking about, of course, is a new kind of inclusivity for the church. I'm not here just thinking of people who've never been able to get out for the last few years physically to a, a church event because of uh, some kind of physical disability or challenge. I'm also thinking of people for whom actually going into a church may awaken memories of trauma or rejection, or people who simply feel even before they get to the door that they're not welcome. And I picked up here and there quite a surprising amount of comment around that. One person I know well who has had some quite serious mental health issues for some years said, is it really only now that people in church realize how difficult it's been for me to cross the, thre the threshold? Because only now can I do that. New inclusivity. People unable, unwilling to participate physically in the way we take for granted, and yet people who need to hear the invitation of grace. <clears throat> and as a kind of subsidiary to that, a, a fourth point here, I hope one thing we've learned is the extraordinary and surprising extent of interest in and sympathy with the activity of the church. When the statistic first appeared, oh, probably about 18 months ago now, that some staggering proportion, over 20% of the British population, had dialed in to some sort of online religious event in the preceding couple of months, I hope we were not only startled, but pleased. We are not, whatever some people might like to say, we are not living in a world of unanimous, systematic, hostility towards religion, or even suspicion of religion. We may in various ways have earned our share of hostility and suspicion. Let's not um, congratulate ourselves prematurely here. But the amazing thing is that the grace of God has somehow continued to speak in and through the messy, 
fractured, fractious reality of the church. And people see there something of what their heart desires. And they hear words they need to hear. And as we think about the mission of the church in the next generation, a subject which currently seems to provoke an extraordinary amount of debate, a bitter debate in the churches, maybe we should just bear in mind steadily and patiently and gratefully that there are out there a remarkable number of people who wouldn't mind taking us seriously if they had the chance. And maybe that's not a bad strapline for thinking about mission privately, not on, not on Darcy's and notepaper. A surprising number of people who would be ready to take us seriously, given the chance. New inclusivities, and that's a follow-on from it. And then, of course, because I'm switching wildly from glass half full to glass half empty here, there are the new exclusivities. What about all those people who don't have electronic access and digital skills? What about those people who find negotiating the application form for a COVID vaccination certificate just too much? Difficult enough for many of us who are supposed to know their way around things. But what about those who don't have the literacy that you need to negotiate online application forms, who don't have the actual physical equipment to do it. Again and again, I'm struck by how much the provision made in our society in the last couple of years takes for granted that pretty well everybody, brackets, everybody who counts, has the skill and the physical equipment to cope with this increasingly digitized world of information and communication. And of course, that applies within the church as well. If we're going to get very enthusiastic and slightly messianic about the possibilities of online worship, put the brakes on for a moment and just cast an eye around and think, so who's outside this time? We like to think we've grown out of being an exclusive church in some ways. We like to think the new opportunities are there. Don't rush into supposing that all the problems are thereby solved. Now, the new kinds of community that I mentioned, the new kinds of togetherness we've discovered online, have of course revealed new capacities for both organization and communication in the whole people of God. I'd say that one of the positives that we may have learned in the last year or two is about how those capacities can be put to work. Again, I think of parochial experience, lay people involved because clergy are often slightly less than technological wizards, lay people involved with skills in communication, simply setting up a live stream event from a church. That's important but also those who have faithfully continued <clears throat> to organize and sustain discussion groups, those who have organized and sustained different kinds of connection, visiting schemes, checking in on those who can't get out. Those who, again in our little parish in Cambridge, produced, not just weekly, but daily, a news sheet with a prayer and a meditation and a photograph. This in a parish without a full-time parish priest. So yes, there's been, I hope, a learning about the capacities that we've slightly bypassed because we haven't needed some of those capacities in quite the same way. And so the question is, the hope and the risk, can we now build on that? Can we not forget that that's something we learned about the skill and the readiness of so many lay people in Christian congregations up and down the country?
Glass half empty again for the next point. One thing which most congregations report over the last couple of years is how very, very difficult it's been to sustain the interest and involvement of younger people in congregations. I've heard time and again <clears throat> of parishes which had decided to cancel their confirmation. They couldn't just go on having confirmation classes for 18 months. And having done that, they lost the young people involved. Young people, always a bit of a rarity in church circles, are not trickling back in any great quantity. Children's work is very, very, very slowly reviving in a number of churches I know of. Work with that middle area, that very, very difficult and challenging area of mid to late teens is not, as far as I can see, reviving nearly as well. And that, you might think, is a bit of a paradox, because isn't this the generation that's supposed to live online? Well, yes, but of course what the church provides online isn't exactly what young people tend to live with online. And if we were to try and compete with what a lot of young people live with online, we'd have a number of substantial theological and moral questions to deal with. So let's not imagine again that there's a quick answer to that. But let's also bear in mind that for all young people, young people, all these awful generalizations, for all that young people take for granted levels of electronic communication that people of my age can barely imagine, they're also a generation who do rather manifestly value physical togetherness as well. And my sense from my own children and their friends is that those broadly speaking under 35, don't see digital connectedness and physical proximity as mutually exclusive alternatives. We have these nightmares and fantasies of a generation arising incapable of dealing with the real world because they spend all their time gazing at a screen. I think that is a serious misreading of that generation. Others may have other views, but I would be very cautious about taking that for granted. So if I say that young people are not coming back very quickly, even if they were there in the first place, that's not an observation or a counsel of despair. It's noting a fact, noting something which we need to think about and learn from. And then my eighth point about learning about ourselves and the church. I did warn you of those 16 points. We've also learned quite a bit about the fault lines in our existing systems of being church. Fault lines that were already there. And suddenly it's as if someone has driven a chisel into the line and banged it hard, and the crack has spread. Fault lines to do with our models of financial viability. How does the church do its business in regard to money? Fault lines about ministry. What can we actually, in the middle to long term, what can we actually afford? Fault lines sometimes about unrealistic expectations of ministry and of worship. Fault lines about the lack of understanding in many Christian contexts of what worship is fundamentally about. Fault lines in what we've been used to and the cracks definitely spreading. Again, that's not a recommendation of some sort of apocalyptic despair. It's an observation. Our life as church congregations was more fragile than we realized. And thank God, we've had the chance to spot that. And therefore, the question, the challenge, so what now?
anticipating the, uh, the question period, the answer to your question, so how do we do that, is I don't know, <laughs> but I hope there might be some exchange on the subject. So, what have we learned about the church? New inclusions, new exclusions. New possibilities, a new sense of our limitation. A deeper awareness of what's possible when we can't meet physically, and perhaps a deeper, more visceral understanding of why it does matter to meet physically. All these things swirling around in our sense of what the church might be. So, when we're thinking about what we've learned in the church connection, some of the things we were reflecting on about the world and society, about humility and generosity and prudence, come in as well. Interdependence, once again, the balance of realism and vision, the importance of embodiment, locality, actual connectedness in the material world. Self-awareness, a real unillusioned acknowledgement that we're limited, that we're not capable of infinite resource, wisdom and success. Perhaps also, and really not to be underrated in all this, learning something about the virtue of fidelity, of not going away. In my first section, I asked, what is it that we reward? And I think what a lot of people saw and acknowledged and were grateful for in frontline workers in the first, especially the first 12 months of the pandemic, was something we could call fidelity. People held to their posts. You can dismiss it and say, well, of course, that's what they're paid to do. But you and I know it's not quite as simple as that. Some of you may have read that truly extraordinary piece in The New Statesman in Easter 2020 by a London doctor, which was simply a week's diary from the front line of intensive care. Many people um, in the regular New Statesman feature of what's, what's your favorite New Statesman feature ever have mentioned that article because it was such a poignant, heartfelt account of what it's like to try to sustain both compassion and efficiency under the heaviest pressure imaginable. And it was a document witnessing to fidelity. Someone who was, was not just doing their job, but who believed that part of what they were called to do and to be was to give people the message that they were not going to be abandoned, that they were not going to be left alone. That in itself is a profoundly positive bit of learning, I would say. And that to me does balance out some of the more disturbing background noise of the last couple of years. I mentioned already that we're living, it seems, in a climate of high emotional temperatures. Collaborative intelligence doesn't always seem in vast supply. Conspiracy theories, on the other hand, are in generous supply. And tribal polarities of different kinds have emerged in quite surprising ways. For some people, being, if not a complete COVID skeptic, then at least a vaccine skeptic, has come to be associated with a whole range of other rather strange theories about the way the world is and the way the world is run. And um, I must say I took enormous and unchristian satisfaction in the spectacle of the former President of the United States um, being booed by an audience when he pointed to the enormous success of his management of the COVID crisis. Because, of course, if you're a truly orthodox believer in the Trumpian base, you don't believe there was a panic at, uh, pandemic at all. So 
actually, the, president's, the former president's claim to have dealt successfully with the pandemic was something of an own goal. Well, the whirligig of time brings its revenges, as Shakespeare again remarks, but passing on rapidly, in this climate of skepticism, cynicism, and sometimes deliberately engineered misinformation. We do need, I would say, as a church, to be reflecting quite hard on what it's like to live as a community of truth and exploration, generosity, repentance in the middle of this often untruthful and frequently unrepentant environment. We need, as believers, to have vividly before us the sense that, as Jesus says, the truth will set us free. And to realize that that truth which will set us free is precisely the truth of the kind of beings we are. Mortal, physical, fragile, needy, generous, beautiful, unpredictable. If we've learned nothing from the last couple of years, I'd like to think some of us at least may have intuited something about the sheer, radical, difficult mysteriousness of being human. And the strangeness in neutral and evolutionary terms, the strangeness of the way in which we need to express to one another our valuation of one another. In one sense, you might say, what does it matter that I couldn't go to my grandmother's funeral? And yet, who is it that would say it doesn't matter? People need to express, to sacramentalize, we almost could say, to sacramentalize their sense of connection with one another. And that's part of this unpredictable, radical, beautiful humanity which we belong to. So how do we learn again to be that kind of church, the church that people would take seriously if they had a chance to. A church that did embody some of these virtues and some of these visions. Because, of course, if we can learn to be more effectively and more eloquently one church held together with those convictions, maybe we can actually make a necessary contribution to living as one world, which God knows we need to do as never before in our age of environmental crisis, pandemic, the dissolution of bonds, the corruption of power. So what have we learned? Maybe some of this, maybe other things you'd like to share, but that's a starter for 10 anyway. Thank you for listening patiently. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, lots to take in. I didn't want to take notes because I was sitting too near the front. <laughs> I thought that might distract you. I may have to listen again tomorrow. <laughs> Um, Stacy's got the roving microphone. If, yes, there's Stacy at the back. Um, and so, if you would like to ask a question or um, pose a point of view or a suggestion, um, please raise your hand, and Stacy will call round. Um, if you could speak out very clearly and keep your question brief, um, but speak out clearly so that um, it's picked up by our audience at home. Thank you very much. The gentleman here, Stacy. Gentleman here. 
And then this gentleman. Should be on. It is. Thank you very much indeed for your thoughts and uh, helpful uh, ways in which you cause us to reflect and learn. You ended by uh, hoping that we might be more united um, because the world needs us to be more united. But I didn't pick up any sense of denominational unity or church unity in your earlier comments. And I wondered if we've the, the, the need for us to coalesce around the very particular communities that we know have excluded the other senses of mm. ecumenism that's, mm. that perhaps uh, existed before? That's a very interesting question, or, or set of questions, really. Um, yes. To be honest, with you, I think I have to think about that. Um, so what you're getting is very much off the top of my head here, forgive me. Um, no, I didn't say much about ecumenism, partly because I thought the, the levels of communication and collaboration between the churches in the early stages of the, of the pandemic were not brilliant. You know, we were out of step with one another on various things. We, and then, of course, within our churches, we started quarreling bitterly about whether it was right to close churches and whether the archbishop should have celebrated from his kitchen on Easter Sunday morning, oh, all of that um, kind of Twitter nonsense. And um, that, that wasn't terribly helpful. But I suppose the question about what the Christian community is fundamentally committed to actually has quite a bit to do with physical place and physical nearness, but for the simple fact that my fellowship in the church is never completely dependent on my choice and my convenience. And one of the, the risks, if we were to veer more towards online norms of meeting and togetherness, would be we'd all be opting in to what suited us. We could come when we wanted and leave when we wanted and hear what we wanted and not what we didn't want to do. We have all, I'm sure, at some point or another in our lives fantasized about how wonderful it would be if we simply had a little off switch which we could press during somebody's sermon. But actually, listening to bad sermons, sitting next to tiresome people, engaging with bores over coffee, people having to engage with us over coffee, you know, all of these things are part of what it is to grow in the virtue of being church. So that kind of unity that difficult unity may be one of the things we've slightly put at risk here. But I'm not answering your question, I'm just rabbiting on. I'm trying to think my way. Let's, let's just leave it as a, as a good question. I'm happy to think further about it. Thank you, Rowan, for a really helpful gathering up of thoughts. Um, I wonder if I could ask you a slightly personal question. Um, and and I, I feel I'd like to ask you to limit it to one, just one thing in your answer. Um, what would you say got you through pandemic? You personally, I suppose we've all got our stories uh, of what it was. What, what's the one thing that got you through? But could I possibly ban the answer God? <laughs> Not fair. <laughs> mm. Thinking of the first lockdown, probably the garden and the river, if I can put those together. It was the most extraordinary grace that in that first lockdown period, so much of the country, we were able to go out in bright sunshine and make the most of it. And the quiet of the streets, the quiet of the riverside, all of that, I think, really was a daily anchorage. A walk through our garden, down to the side of the river, 
back again. Not, not a long one, but just enough to touch base. I think that, that went for a lot. And I do remember, if I can just respond to your invitation to be personal, the first Easter of lockdown, trying to live stream a rather makeshift Easter vigil in the garden of Magdalen College, Cambridge, next to the river at six in the morning. The chaplain and myself, who are neither of us um, technological wizards, rather clumsily doing an Easter service together. And at the end of it, a very large swan soaring along the river behind us and just landing very quietly <laughs> as we switched off, I thought. <laughs> the factor I'm not supposed to mention had something to do with that. <laughs> Is David over there? Oh, sorry. Hi, everyone. I mean, thank you for this wonderful, enlightening talk. I mean, do you have this idea of the fidelity? And I find it quite interesting, in particular, this connection between climate crisis and pandemic, because I guess what it, con what it sort of called us to do in some ways is maybe fidelity to change. Because what I find the key message of the pandemic was that we learned to do change. Something that my grandmother talked about, what she experienced within the war. Mm. There were circumstances out of her control imposed onto her having to live with adapting to change, really rapid change, over which you don't have any control. Um, and my question is, if this may be what we are called to do, is this fidelity towards change, um, is how are we going to do this? <laughs> how are we going to, with the climate crisis, because what we learned in the pandemic is can we see we, have, we could have streets without cars. Mm. And this is provocative, it touches on people's quite a lot of personal things, but is if we could do it with the pandemic, why can't we do it yeah. in the light of the climate crisis? Thank you so much. I couldn't agree more. I think in those, again, in those first few months, a surprising number of people did think, well, you know, maybe it could be different. And maybe we could be, in your wonderful phrase, faithful to change, in that sense. And what gets in the way? Well. We all revert to our default settings very rapidly. And I think we do so partly because we, we tend to, what should I say? We tend to look for our point of balance, often in what we hang on to, rather than what we internalize. If you have an internal point of balance, like riding a bicycle, you know, you can wobble quite a lot, but the, the center of gravity is there somewhere. If you have no internal center of gravity, then you will want to hang on to things. You will you know, you have to make your way awkwardly along. And I think if we want to talk about the importance of the life of the spirit in the widest possible sense for the human world, it's surely in saying that's part of learning how to be anchored in yourself in such a way that you can actually move with fluidity and responsiveness. It sounds like a paradox, but that's the faithfulness to change thing, I'd say. So how do we do it? Lord knows. Um, we need, I think, to, to pursue conversations about this wherever we find ourselves because of this enormous pull and power of back to normal. Um, and people would say 12 or 18 months ago, well, I don't know what normal is any longer. And I slightly fear that now, as we're emerging a bit, people are near enough to where they thought they were to think, oh, we're back to normal. We can stop worrying about change. So keeping our feet to the fire a bit on change is important. Okay. And, well, obviously, with the climate situation, it is just that sense that maybe you could have streets without cars, yes, or maybe you could have skies without 
quite as many jets. Rowan, you talked about the um, discovery of the laity's gifts in your um, church in Cambridge. But paradoxically, we hear stories again and again and again of churches where people have stopped doing things. Mm -hmm. The church that I belong to had a pre-pandemic congregation of 170 on a Sunday morning. Now we can't even fill the coffee rotor on a Sunday mm. morning. In your reflections, mm. can you shed some light on yeah. that paradox? Yes. Um. <clears throat> it's as if we're again slightly at risk of a situation where in valuing and recognizing the gifts of some of the laity, you end up creating a new sort of elite, a new, new set of insiders who can, who can do the stuff, who can cope with, with all that. And that's the downside. And I, I recognize that while thinking it's broadly positive. But the not coming back thing. Well, I'd be interested to hear other people's experience because you know I, I see this now in my church in Cardiff as one of the issues we're looking at constantly, same sort of shift of um, numbers, the same difficulty in filling, filling roles. And I just wonder if people have almost woken up to the fact that they were all too used to being passive, in church and they don't want to go on being there? I don't know. I really don't know. Some of it is about personal risk, some of it's about personal convenience, some of it is just getting out of the habit, I'm sure. But I wonder if, if there are those who, when it came down to it, thought, I'm not sure I see quite how or why it matters for me to be, to be there simply being being passive, who knows? Thinking out loud again. <clears throat> yep, microphone coming. Thank you, Rowan. You've obviously spoken to the Christian community. Do you have any observations on other faith communities' response to the pandemic? Mm. Um, well, <clears throat> one of the conversations I've uh, had regularly during the pandemic period has been with a a Jewish friend in Manchester. And as far as I can see, a lot of the difficulties we've been talking about affecting how church is done have affected the synagogue as well. For a really orthodox Jew, as we sometimes forget, the synagogue is not an absolute essential. It's a good opportunity to gather, to reinforce one another, discover one another, um, good opportunity to be instructed, but Jewish identity is perhaps rather more focused on what you do in the household and what you do in keeping the commandments in daily life, so not felt quite so acutely, and yet I still hear these laments from Orthodox Jewish friends, actually people are not coming to shul as, as they used to, They're the same sort of dynamic. I wish I knew more about um, how Muslim communities have responded. I, I'm patron of a charity in Swansea, which um, works with minority ethnic young people, including a substantial number of Muslims. Um, what impressed me in seeing some of the work that they do, these young people as community volunteers, is how very effectively mosques were mobilized as centers of information and support and much else beside feeding too sometimes and one wonderful young man in Swansea looking around for um, problems that he felt were not being solved with some of his friends from the mosque decided 
what he ought to do was simply to deliver snacks to NHS workers when they came off their shifts. Workers with long, long hours and short breaks. Well, he said, why don't we just go up with lots of packs of crisps to Morriston Hospital and make sure that we're there with a friendly word and some refreshment. Or, so, yeah, communities have responded in their different ways, often very positively. And I'm impressed that synagogues and mosques have, at least as much as churches, risen to this and not just battened down the hatches. Thank you very much. Um, I became, I, throughout the pandemic, kept coming back to the Old Testament warning um, given to the children of Israel uh, that when you get to the promised land and you begin to thrive and get fat, uh, do not forget the Lord your God um, and think it's by your own hand you have achieved all this. Um, it seems to me to be rather a good parallel with the Western world in the present time. And I wonder whether the Western world should have, or maybe even beginning to, um, as it were, become aware of that warning and, and see whether it has any truth to it. I think the short answer is yes. Um, I wish we were better equipped to deliver that warning in a credible way. Because, of course, as a church, we're so often, as churches, we're so often caught up in a version of that Western modern sensibility, which, for all our religious noises, boils down to much the same assumption that, yeah, we've got it sorted, we've got it wrapped up. And sometimes we, I don't know, we market, I use the word advisedly, a spirituality which suggests it's all about getting it wrapped up and getting the problems sorted. And that sense of embracing our real frailty and saying, I'm going to die, but it's not the end of the world, so to speak. Saying, we are all deeply dependent on one another, and there is no shame in that. You know, saying these things with real clarity, acting on, on those things, that's, I suppose, that's part of the good news. The good news of, of the Christ who comes to a human race which actually needs to be reminded of its mortality and its glory equally. But yeah, looking around at what passes for Western civilization at the moment, it's a little bit of a dog's breakfast, isn't it? And again, I'm afraid, coming back to the question of the cultures that we tolerate, the culture of triviality and dishonesty in politics, cultures of prejudice and misogyny, still so powerful. What did we discover about the Metropolitan Police? And of course, cultural wars, the strange weaponizing of convictions in a completely zero-sum style. If you think that, you're not just wrong, you're wicked. So much of that. What a mess. And there's a, a wonderful essay by a, an American um, Roman Catholic commentator called on being a conscientious objector in the culture wars, in which he sets out why he really cannot be bothered to fight all these issues all the time, because there has to be something about human commonality that's more important than all this. I hope it's OK to um, offer a question as the microphone carrier. I didn't see any hands up. And um, at this point, I would say if anyone on this side would like to put their hands up, then please <laughs> do. But in the meantime, I'd like to offer my questions. So the themes that are being picked up are around fidelity and fragility. And we've talked about the link to the world. Um, I think the 16th point that you made, pointing back to the church and to ministry, I, I hear that you were trying to avoid the question, but um, I hope it's okay to kind of pose it back to you. So in my own place, I'm a self-supporting minister. Um, I went forward as a young vocation, 
part of a cohort of young people coming through, some of whom are facing what will probably be a portfolio of ministry where we may have paid jobs at some times, we may be unpaid at others. This is a rather different landscape from the Church of England 10, 20, 100 years ago. And there's something about these two themes, and I wondered if you could mm. explore and expand on that, mm. and whether you have any thoughts of um, what you would hope to see in the future. Thank you. I think you, you really put your finger on an important element which, which we can't avoid in looking into the future, what you call the portfolio ministry. I really do doubt, for many reasons, that we can sustain a lifelong stipendiary ministry for very many people in the future, just because of where we are um, financially. That doesn't mean we can't sustain a serious, imaginative, theologically literate ministry. It really doesn't. And the notion that, that there's no contradiction or embarrassment in moving from one mode of ministry to another, that's something which we need to be working on. So, I, yes, in answer to your question, I would certainly hope to see something of that developing with the appropriate structures of resourcing, stimulus, and support that it requires. Because what panics people a bit, as you've probably noticed, about changing patterns of ministry is, as much as anything these days, the notion that I hear from such a lot of clergy, I'm, I'm left swinging in midair. I'm not quite sure if my diocese likes or approves of me. I'm not quite sure if my congregation likes or approves of me. I've got nobody else to compare notes with within several miles. Um, I never know whether I've done a proper day's work or not. You know, are you telling me it's got to be even more insecure? I think that you know, that's a bit what I pick up, and I guess you, you're not unfamiliar with, with those noises. So how do we build not only a theologically literate, but a religiously confident ministry? And I think those two things go together. I would say that having a real theological literacy for ordained ministry in the church is absolutely bound up with, I suppose, helping people discover where, where they stand, what they stand upon. It's the anchorage thing again. It's the, the spiritual gravity and focus that's needed in these complicated and challenging circumstances. So again, um, I think it was yesterday, I was I'm sitting in on a meeting of the World Community for Christian Meditation which some of you may know about. And that's a community, <clears throat> originally Roman Catholic in its inspiration, but completely ecumenical now. A community which increasingly looks towards the needs of people who are in quite demanding and irregular sorts of role and seeks to work with them in terms of helping them form a practice of meditation and openness which will give them that anchorage. So that's another thing I hope that in the next 20, 30 years, our formation of ordained ministers will be that kind of theological formation which actually tells you who it is you have believed in, in scriptural language, something like that. But maybe, just, maybe I could add a little bit of script. Oh, we've got some. One, yeah, short paragraph, <laughs> um, just a, an extra. I think it also means that our patterns of congregational life and worship are going to be quite, quite radically under, I wouldn't say under threat, but under, under stress. We try to maintain exactly what we've got. Somebody was saying to me the other day that for all sorts of reasons, they were now seeing far more people coming to the Thursday morning service than the Sunday morning service. And you scratch your head about that and you think, well, actually, people are coming from where they can come and when they can come, and that's, that's an inevitability. And it may be that we're looking in 30 or 40 years' time, perhaps sooner, at 
very different, what I sometimes think of as overlapping waves of activity in congregations where you know, small groups meet very regularly, get together a little bit, more reg a little bit less regularly for medium-sized gatherings, and maybe once a year have an enormous diocesan pilgrimage or something. And that that movement from the cell to the congregation to the wider fellowship is something we could, we could seriously look at, which would very much change how we approach the use of our buildings and so on. But that's a bit in the air, and I'm longing to hear from the next questioner. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, something around the pandemic seemed to shake the church from some of the institutional baggage, and I'm not a sort of Puritan, go back to New Testament time person, um, paid up employee of the institution. <laughs> but given what you said about how very quickly re we revert to type, and given the anxiety that is around some of the things you've described about um, finances, for example, and how creativity can be squashed when we're under stress. What would you advise those of us inside institutions to help be an antidote to that institutional drive of just maintaining the institution almost for its own sake? You know, that tendency to just pull back to its own um, identity. I think actually that is where the building of trustful relational groups is important for those in ministry, for those in lay ministry, those just identifying as lay people. Build those groups which, if not independent of the institution, don't simply depend on the institution for their, their energy. It may, be, it may be the Thursday morning service um, another story, which I've often told in this respect, from uh, a priest working in rural Lincolnshire who had inherited, as happens in rural Lincolnshire, the care of about 16 parishes over a, an enormous area. And um, in one of those churches, there was a, a Wednesday morning Eucharist at 10.30, as there often is. Um, when that got down to a regular congregation of one, she began to ask herself, is this actually what we ought to be doing? And as she asked that question, she noticed that when she took communion to a housebound parishioner in another of the parishes, that housebound parishioner's friends would come, maybe four or five of them. And she suddenly realized, well, actually, that's where the, the Eucharistic community is somehow reforming, reshaping itself and began to put her energy into that. So it's having the antennae to see where some of those trustful, natural community events are arising, putting a bit of investment into that. And I think making sure that we who are in ministerial positions have, have the right kind of community sounding boards and support systems we need. Because I think only that kind of rootedness in and with each other gets us through institutional crisis. Without that, as I said, we, we cling on the support. We don't have the, yeah, the natural balance within somehow. That makes sense. I I'm, I'm wondering if I can encourage you into some optimism um, as we get towards the end of the evening. Um, and I've been trying to frame a question around the, 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 some of the fault lines that you pointed us to in, in the world and in the church. And also then that uh, lovely phrase you used a few minutes ago, the dog's, bre dog's breakfast of Western civilization. Um, Church and, and state, or church and political power, church and empire, church and culture have been very closely coupled for a, a few centuries, haven't they, in, 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 in our world, in the Western civilized world, so-called. And it's the, the, they, have, they, have they sustained one another with a rather thin 
myth of progress that in the end is probably not terribly helpful. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting a question that's something like, I wonder if you think a, a, a big fault line might have developed between church or Christian communities, however they're, they're, they're found, and the forces of empire and cultural mm -hmm. advancement, and whether in the very long run, beyond our lifetimes, but in God's, in God's time perhaps, that might not be a good thing for the future health of the church. Mm -hmm. I suspect it might well be, um, and I think you're right, there, there has been a bit of a symbiosis between a rather shallow cultural optimism and a rather shallow Christian optimism. Um, things are getting better all the time, well, no, they're not really. Um, some things are and lots of things aren't. And I think for the Christian church to retain its integrity, it needs perhaps to weigh what Jesus says in the Gospel. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? In other words, there's no um, foreordained story according to which either church or civilization sweeps on triumphantly to a maximal, optimal situation. Perhaps it just won't be like that. We can hope and pray and work for it and do it day by day, saying, today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, that's where we start. At the um, <coughs> meditation meeting last night, the point was being made, entry into the present moment is the best way of preparing for the future. Because if you can actually anchor yourself in this moment without distraction, without terror, anxiety, egotistical flailing around, if you can anchor yourself in this moment, you will actually be freer to make the decisions you need to make tomorrow and the day after. If you try to live your life out of the anxieties of tomorrow and the day after, you'll never actually inhabit the present moment. But where else is God to be found but in the present moment? Philippa, you, you had a question. Sorry, yes, I... Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned uh, God Archbishop. Uh, Men with just an observation, um, uh, something which I, I noticed in the um, communities that I serve. Even before the vaccine was discovered, there was that feeling of helplessness. And um, the only lesson that we learned um, was that no one is in control, only God is. And I remember when we were allowed to open our buildings, one lady came in to say a prayer, and she said to me, Philip, I've never ever needed God more than I do now. Thank you. I think that's, that's really a very good note to, um, to conclude on. Thank you, Philip. I'd like to um, thank Rowan again myself um, I'll turn the evening round a bit and just give the notices and then ask John to come and give the vote of thanks. Um, so next month, um, and the date escapes me, but it's the third Wednesday, we are actually looking at climate change, aren't we? Looking for one of the... Yes, we are. Um, Bethany Solder, Solderer is coming to talk about climate change is here, so what do we do now? So it actually will be a very good... Uh, follow on from tonight's talk. Um, uh, I think that's all the business for tonight. So I'd like to ask John to come and give a vote of thanks. Um, so this is, I'm asking John Butler, and uh, this is in a way a way of me being able to give a vote of thanks to John, because John and Jill may be not with us for very much longer. They're going to be moving house um, and uh, away. <laughs> Uh, we're moving away from us. But John spent a very long time nurturing Canterbury Contemporary Theology Group for many years and for many years as chair. And uh, it's largely, not largely, but very largely down to what uh, John did that we're still as flourishing as we are today. So I'd just like to make a public uh, thank you to John and for Jill for supporting him.
Come. <clears throat> um, Rowan, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to welcome you back to Canterbury, and I hope you feel that you're coming back to friends. Um, the key question for us this evening is what have we learnt? And one of the things that I've learnt is how much we've missed you. We've missed... <clears throat> We've missed your wisdom, we've missed your fluency, we've missed the depth of your thinking, we've missed the breadth of your intellectual interests, which may even take you rather by surprise because I found that you made 18 points, not 16. <laughs> I was never any good at maths. And, that, and I'd be very happy afterwards just to remind you of the two that you missed. <laughs> um, I think we will all take different things away from your talk. I think one of the things that I will really take away um, is the way that you've reminded us that as a result of what we've been through, there are opportunities. I think there was a very positive, forward-looking, visionary, opportunistic element to what you had to say. Um, but of course, here's the problem, because to take advantage of opportunities, we have to learn, and we also have to change. And change is hugely difficult. Change in institutions is very, very difficult. And change in ourselves is, is difficult too. Um, but I think that's what's facing us over the next two or three years. And I've got a very happy solution to that because I'm going to suggest to Judith that we invite you back in February 2025. I think three years is probably good enough. Um, <laughs> for you to tell us what you think we have learnt and how we have assimilated it and whether and if so how we've changed. So I hope you've got your diary with you um, and I'm sure you can arrange the date with Judith. So um, we send you back to Cambridge with our deep affection, with our deep respect and with our immense gratitude for what you've given us obviously during your time as Archbishop, um, but also your friendship here with us this evening. Um, I hope you go back and enjoy your garden and the river and the swan. I, I, I had palpitations when you introduced the swan because I seem to remember that at the beginning of the pandemic, a rogue swan appeared on the River Cam that was eventually issued with an ASBO to keep it away. And I wondered how you were going to build that into the parable, but fortunately that wasn't necessary. Rowan, thank you so much. We wish you well.